Hello grade 11s and grade 12s and welcome back to another video with me, Miss Martins. In today's video, we're going to be looking at Coulomb's Law. We're going to be looking at the definition, formula, how to apply the formula, an important theory that you need to know in order to answer questions on Coulomb's Law in grade 11 and in grade 12. Remember to stick around throughout the entire video. I give teacher tips that can help you level up your marks. I am a teacher. I set moderate and mark exam papers all the way up to matric so I know what you should do to avoid silly mistakes in your exams. So let's jump right in but subscribe for more videos like this. Behind me you can see a screenshot from the exam guidelines. This is for grade 12s but grade 11s I suggest that you look at this as well because although this is a document that is directed towards grade 12s, electrostatics is something that you learn in grade 11. So this is what we can ask you in your exams. This is what you will be tested on. So Behind me, you can see that I've listed, well, they've listed Coulomb's law over here. You also get for electric field. This will be linked in the description box below. But behind me, you can see exactly what you need to know for Coulomb's law. Now, this video is just going to be a very brief overview of the definition, the formula, and a basic calculation. But I do have a summary video on Coulomb's law and videos where I go into more detail. But the definition is very, very important. You need to learn it word for word in order to get all your definition marks. And this is the formula sheet that you will receive for electrostatics in grade 11 and in grade 12. You do, need, do not need to memorize these formulae, but you do need to know how to use these formulae. One thing that you do need to know how to memorize, unfortunately, are the conversions. So when I do the example, I will show you how to make use of this. But basically, charge is what is electrostatics is all about. Charge is measured in coulombs, big C. That is the unit of measurement. However, sometimes the charge is tiny, tiny, tiny. So we don't use coulombs, we use picocoulombs or nanocoulombs or microcoulombs or millicoulombs. It's kind of like instead of meters, we use millimeters or centimeters. That's basically what this is like. So if I give you charge in, let's say, nanocoulombs, you need to know how to convert that to coulombs. So if I say that the charge is 6 nanocoulombs, you need to know, okay, cool, for nanocoulombs to convert, I must times by 10 to the power of negative 9. So 6 times 10 to the power of negative 9 coulombs. That's how you convert nanocoulombs to coulombs. If I give you 3 microcoulombs, you need to know to convert microcoulombs, you must times by 10 to the negative 6. So it'll be 3 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. This stuff is not given on your formula sheet. This stuff is stuff that you need to memorize. Right, now let's jump into Coulomb's Law. Now before we do Coulomb's Law, you do need to understand the forces that exist between charges. So if I have like charges, so in other words, they have the same type of charge, positive, positive, or negative negative what you need to know is that like charges repel so if the charges are the same they repel they move away from each other it's an electrostatic force of repulsion however if they are opposite charges so a plus and a negative or unlike charges a positive and a negative they will attract and that is super super important to understand in the context of coulomb's law you also need to know that this electrostatic force of attraction and repulsion depends on two things. They are kind of obvious. I hope they are at least. The closer your charges are together, so if I bring them, yeah, they're far apart. If I bring them closer together, they are going to have a stronger force of attraction or repulsion, depending on if they're positives or negatives. The further apart they are, the weaker their force of attraction or repulsion. So the distance between them, technically the distance between their centers, so how far their centers are apart from one another, that can determine the force. The bigger the distance, the smaller the force. The smaller the distance, so the closer they are, the smaller the distance between their centers, the bigger the force. The other thing that can affect the electrostatic force is the size of the charges. So if they have more charge, if they have a bigger charge, their force is stronger. That should make sense. So there's two things that impact the size or the magnitude of electrostatic force, and that is the distance between the objects. 
technically the distance between the object centers. So in other words, this is the center of the one and this is the center of the other, the distance between their centers and the size of the charged object. And that is basically Coulomb's law, which I will get to in a second. But the other thing that I need you to understand is that Newton's third law of motion is always obeyed. So in this case, I've got positive charge A, sphere A, positive charge sphere B. What did we just say about like charges? They repel. So A will go to the left, B will go to the right. The forces that they exert on each other have the same magnitude, so they have the same size, but they are opposite in direction. So look at the force of B on A, that's 5 newtons, but it's to the left. The force of A on B is also 5 newtons, but it's to the right. So equal in magnitude means both 5 newtons, but opposite in direction, one is left and one is right. Another small thing that I just want you to pay attention to is how we label these forces. So because they have the same type of charge, they're both positive, they will repel one another. A will move to the left because of B. So the force that B has on A is to the left. It's basically what B does to A or what A does because of B. So the force of B on A is to the left. The force of A on B is to the right. And here's another representation. So here we can say the force of Q1 on Q2. This is the force of Q1 on Q2 is to the left. So Q1 pulls Q2 to the left. The force of Q2 on Q1 is to the right. But those forces are equal in magnitude. So if this was 10 Newton to the right, this would be 10 Newton to the left. So this is the definition of Coulomb's law. And as I mentioned to you, definitions are very, very, very important. This definition of Coulomb's law will pop up in most of your papers. So if you take a look at all the years of past papers for grade 11 and grade 12, Coulomb's law is one of the most popular definitions. And if they don't ask Coulomb's law, they ask Newton's law of universal gravitation, which is very, very similar. So knowing the definition off by heart is very important. Knowing all the keywords, the ones underlined are super important. You can't leave them out. If you leave them out, they are wrong. Okay. Other ones that should be underlined is directly proportional to the product of the magnitudes of the charges, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. And I know you're thinking, but ma'am, you're highlighting or underlining everything. I know it's all important. One thing that I tell my students that helps them remember the definition is that it's linked to the formula. So they say the magnitude, so the value of the electrostatic force, so that is F, exerted by one point charge on another point charge, so we're speaking about two charges, is directly proportional to the product of their magnitudes. So product means times, multiplication. And here you can see we are multiplying the charges together. Product of the magnitude of the charges, we are multiplying or we're taking the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. So here you can see we're taking the distance and we're squaring it, square of the distance and inversely proportional. Every time you see inversely proportional, I want you to think of that being underneath the fraction. And what this means is that if the distance gets bigger, the force gets smaller. So compare this for me, a half versus quarter, which one is smaller? Well, if you have a quarter of something that is smaller than a half, a quarter is smaller, but I hope you can see that four is bigger than two. So the bigger the distance gets, the bigger r squared gets, the smaller the force gets. Okay, but I hope you can see how the the definition corresponds to the formula. So you do need to study and learn the definition. Now let's look at the different parts of the formula quickly and what they mean and what their units are. So F is electrostatic force and it's because it's a force it's measured in Newton and because it's a force you need to give a direction unless they say magnitude. 
If they say magnitude, you don't need to give a direction. K is what we call a physical constant. Constant means it will always be that value. And this one is called Coulomb's constant because this is Coulomb's law. And Coulomb's constant is always going to be 9 times 10 to the power of 9. Always and forever. And that will be given on your formula sheet. Then Q1 is the charge of object 1. Okay, so that's the charge of object 1. And it must be measured in Coulombs. So remember what I told you. If they give you the charge in anything but Coulombs, so let's say they give it to you in nano Coulombs or they give it to you in pico Coulombs, you need to convert. Okay, and that's where the conversions from earlier came in. And then Q2 is the charge of object 2. So remember there's two objects. And then R squared or R, let's talk about R. R is the distance between the centers. Now that's super important. Because it's not just distance, it's not just any old distance, it's the distance between the centers of the object. And what that means is if I have my object over here, my two objects, remember I have two objects, I have A and B or object one and object two, I take the center of the first object, I take the center of the second object, and the distance between those centers, that is R. R must be measured in meters. If it's not in meters, and they often give it to you in centimeters or millimeters, you must convert it. Super, super, super important in order to calculate and use the formula correctly. So please do the correct conversions before using the formula. Now, this is a visual representation of the relationships. The electrostatic force is directly proportional to the product of the magnitude of the charges. And directly proportional just means a straight line going through the origin and the electrostatic force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the centers and an inversely proportional relationship looks like this. What it means is that if R, if the distance is very big, the force, read it along this way, is very small. If the distance is very small, so somewhere over here, the force is up here, it's very big. Okay, cool. I will go into the relationships into a lot more detail in the next video or in videos to come, but this is a very, very, very quick overview of those relationships. But let's jump into a question so that you can see how we use the formula. So the question will say, calculate the electrostatic force that sphere A exerts on sphere B. Now, as soon as you see calculate electrostatic force that one object exerts on another, we know we must use Coulomb's law. So let's write the formula down first. You will always get a mark for writing the blank formula as is from the formula sheet. That gets you a mark. Then we get marks for substitution. So remember K is a constant. It will always be that value. It is given on the formula sheet. So let me just show you. I showed you in the beginning of the video. Here is Coulomb's constant given to you on the formula sheet. You don't have to stress, you don't have to memorize it. It's always going to be given to you. Then Q1 is the charge on object one. In this case, let's just pretend A is object one and B is object two. Doesn't matter. Object one has a charge or a sphere A has a charge of two nano coulombs. Now remember what I told you in this formula, you can't put it in as nano coulombs, you must convert it to coulombs. And the conversion from nano coulombs to coulombs is times 10 to the negative nine. So we're gonna go two times 10 to the negative nine. Then Q2 is next in my formula. It's a charge on object two. Now, take note how it is negative 5. I know my diagram is showing a positive here, but it should be a negative. So there we go. Charge B or sphere B is negative 5 nanocoulombs. Now, one rule that you can learn for this formula is we do not need to put signs into the formula. So no signs needed for this formula. What I mean by that is I know that this is a negative. B is a negative charge but I do not need to put it in as a negative. I can put it in as a positive. So five times 10 to the negative nine. Remember, we must convert to coulombs. Now, why do I not need to put the signs in? And what happens if you do? So your teacher might teach you that you put the signs in. 
if you look at the memos of grade 12 papers and also grade 11 papers, the memo will say that we ignore the signs. So if a learner puts signs in there, so if you put negative five, the marker should ignore the signs. But the reason why we don't need the signs, we don't need the, the negatives, is because the, part, the plus and the minus, the positive and the negative, tells me about whether the spheres will attract or repel. That's all it tells me. It doesn't actually interfere with the calculation of calculating F. So I will work out whether they attract or repel at the end, but for now let's continue. R is the distance between the centers. So here's the center of A, here's the center of B. The distance between the centers is 12 centimeters. So R is 12 centimeters, but remember it must be in meters. So to convert from centimeters to meters, you need to know these basic conversions, you need to study them. But to convert from centimeters to meters, um, one meter is 100 centimeters, just by the way. So to convert, you divide by 100. So you're going to have 0, 0,12 meters. Now, please don't forget to square that 0, 0,12. The formula says square, so we must square it. And a very big feature tip is to use brackets when dealing with scientific notation. Often my students don't use brackets and some of their calculators are just a little bit weird and they get the wrong answer. So use your brackets. So I get 6,25 times 10 to the negative 6 Newton. Remember, force is measured in Newton. Now, we need to put a direction. If they say calculate the magnitude of the electrostatic force, we don't need to give a direction. But they didn't say magnitude, which means force is a vector. Vectors need direction, so we need to give a direction. They want to know the force that A exerts on B. So what does A do to B? Which way will B move because of A? What is the force of A on B? Now remember A is a positive and B is a negative. So are they attracted or do they repel? Well, they are attracted to one another. So first of all, I do want you to write attraction. It's an electrostatic force of attraction. And which way will B move because of A? B will be attracted to A. So you can say towards A because it wants to move to towards A. And then you can also say to the left because B will go that way. It'll be attracted to A. It'll move to the left. And that is how you apply Coulomb's law. Now, I hope that that has been helpful. There are more situations in which you need to be able to apply Coulomb's law. So, for example, three charges in one dimension, something like this, um, two charges, three charges in one dimension, and you can also get charges in two dimensions, like a triangular formation like this, where you need to use Pythagoras. I do cover this in other videos in this playlist, so I hope you check that out. Remember to subscribe for more videos, and I'll see you guys in another video in the future. Bye, everyone.